Hey everyone, welcome to Group Text. Well, I don't know anyone who's missed this so far. The new documentary, Where is Wendy Williams, is on Lifetime right now. The talk show host is the subject of a new four-part docu-series called Where is Wendy Williams, now airing on Lifetime, and its executive producers, Erica Hansen and Mark Ford, are joining me today to discuss it. The embattled self-quote queen of media, unquote, was no stranger to grabbing the attention of the spotlight and saying what was on her mind on her syndicated talk show and radio programs. But over the past few years, erratic behavior and health issues caused Wendy to lose her job, control over her money, and so much more. With her family's help, she sought treatment, which sadly revealed numerous health concerns, as well as an ongoing battle with alcohol addiction. We have so much to get into. Mark Ford and Erica Hansen, welcome to Group Text. Okay, I yes. binge watched the entire thing. So I'm going to assume listeners know who Wendy Williams is, but for those who don't know the real details leading up to her fall from grace, such a popular daytime talk show, give them the cliff notes of where of you Wendy. decided yeah. this. there's something here. Well, this uh, project came about um, in 2022. It was a continuation, supposed to be a kind of a continuation of the first documentary we did with Wendy on Lifetime called What a Mess, which was, by the way, her title that she chose. Um, and it was really supposed to be about Wendy's next chapter in life after her divorce, after losing her show, you know, and kind of putting her life together and, and, and relaunching her career there were plans for a podcast called the Wendy Williams experience. And there was kind of a whole new management team and, you know, steps being put into place to try to, you know, get Wendy back into a career. Um, so we went and, you know, um, we're open to that, you know, that narrative and um, created a deal, you know, did a shopping agreement and a deal and a talent agreement with Wendy and, Everybody signed off on it, her management, the Guardian, multiple lawyers, her publicist, everybody was on board, you know, and we started filming and, um, you know, gradually, um, and I think you can see this in the documentary, the reality just became a different story. You know, there, it wasn't going to be about her launching a podcast. Um, it was, it, it revealed itself to be a much deeper, more painful you know, story. And um, we as filmmakers, you know, felt like that was the truthful story that we needed to follow. And by the way, so did Wendy and her management and everybody involved, you know. You, you just brought up a, a, something that I didn't know. A, that you guys did Wendy Williams, What a Mess. But I was going to ask, because she's listed as an executive producer mm -hmm. on this. I knew there, I mean, just because of being in the business, there had to be a shopping agreement, all this paperwork. But I did not know or realize that the Guardian was already involved when you kind of went back to do her relaunch doc. So what yeah, was I mean, her yeah. what was her mental state when you guys came back in the room and said and obviously she knew you and felt comfortable with you guys to say, okay, was she still aware enough to realize like I want to do a comeback, this is gonna be the launch. We're going to track this. This is going to be a fantastic story because the first from the first frame on where you start sort of explaining that that's what you're doing. She clearly did not have a real grasp of what was happening. It was very up and down, as you can imagine, you know, um, so there were conversations, of course, off camera as well, you know, that took place during the course of this and many, frankly, many, many weeks, if not months of going back and forth on legal agreements, you know? Um, but, you know, the first, you know, kind of time we sat down with Wendy and, and spoke to her, um, you know, she was, you know, in her management's words, she had been drinking, you know, and it wasn't a good day. And that was a very brief shoot, you know? Yes. Um, I think you see that in, in you know, um, the top of the documentary, it's my voice that you hear, you know, talking to her and we may be shot for, an hour, you know, with her that day, because we felt like it, it just wasn't, you know, going to be helpful to continue filming with her. Um, 
But when we, you know, looked at the footage and talked to management about it, there was a whole nother conversation of like, you know, she's had a really tough day, but she still really wants to do this. She was out of it that day, guys, like she's going into, you know, a, a treatment center, you know, and we, this is all documented in the film. We're very transparent, right. About the process oh, totally. of everything that we encountered along the way. And then, and then, the, then it was more, you know, discussions and agreements. And um, as she came out of, the treatment center there were more off camera and then on camera you know conversations about like where we're going with this wendy was excited about it we actually showed wendy the footage that we shot you know that original day she loved it you know um was not you know worried about it um was very open um about her substance abuse issues and you know wanted to talk about it she talked about them on her show um but and that was at the point, you know, that Erica, you know, came on board and we hired um, her as a direct as the showrunner and brought on a, a different team, you know, um, that a very small, close knit team, most of whom had experience, you know, in their own lives or in their families' lives with substance abuse issues, because we were very sensitive that we were embarking on this journey with somebody who had substance abuse issues. So that was foremost in our mind because we knew that was going on and we didn't know the depth the extent to which there were other cognitive issues you know and you can hear us questioning from you know almost the first day like is she ready for a podcast is this the best you know situation for her because we had expectations going into it that you know weren't really you know unfolding in the way that was promised or expected and that's okay you know when you're filming a documentary the story takes its own on its own trajectory and it goes where it goes. And Lifetime was also like generous enough to us, you know, to extend our shooting, you know, to allow us to give Wendy breaks, to find our feet and connect with the family and make sure that that part of the story was being told. Um, so this was very touch and go. And there were days when Wendy was like the old Wendy and, and had a lot of clarity and there were days where she was not and we were always asking that question why is she off like what's really going on here and the answers we were getting back were like she's fine keep going you know there's no worries here and you can hear the producers going really like uh so um I, and I'll, I'll kind of allow erica to jump in here now because she had her own kind of experience as she you know moved into the the filming and was with wendy you know, day in and day out. Well, that's what I wanted to ask you when you just brought that up, which I did not realize. Okay, Erica, here you are. Yeah, this sounds interesting. I'm assuming you watched What a Mess. Okay, I know what I'm getting into. I know the public persona. I know there's been trials and tribulations and treatment and all this. Okay, sounds like an interesting job. And then you show up. You yeah. had to be like, what have I walked into? Uh, yeah, no, it, I really, um, I really did when we, when I first started, I was very intrigued by this. Well, one, you know, Wendy has an extraordinary career, a real trailblazer. And I thought, you know, here's this woman at midlife embarking on the next chapter of her life. And, you know, that a lot of women reinvent themselves, have to make big turns and transformations later in life. So I was very intrigued by that. And then as we started to film, as Mark said, and as you see, um, the story became something else. And we had to really be nimble and sensitive in trying to follow it. We talked to Wendy every single, every, we didn't film every day, maybe a couple of days a week, but we always had conversations and we were a very small team. I worked very closely with our colleague, Michael Armstrong, the two of us were like joined at the hip with our crew. And, you know, every day we talked to Wendy about what we were going to do and, you know, really trying to be a fly on the wall to her life um, as she began to prepare to do this podcast. Um, and it, you know, there, as Mark said, there were some days where you could, Wendy was there and her unfiltered, funny humor, <laughs> irreverent. Um, and then we began to see how she was really struggling. And the I was very concerned um, about her relationship with alcohol and um, and her loneliness 
you know, that became apparent very quickly. She lived for a woman who thrives on people. And think about it. We've all worked in a collaborative medium of, of television. Um, you know, when during COVID, I think don't think I had any idea of the impact of isolation on her, which DJ Booth helped explain. Um, and we suddenly realized we were shedding light on Wendy at a stage in her life. Remember, she had just been with her family in Miami, and it was during this year that we were with her. And it dawned on us the importance of seeing what is happening to her in her life under the care of a guardianship with very little, if any, contact with her family. Um, there wasn't food in the apartment. I know food was delivered, but very, I mean, she was, it's just, there. Were, I was terrified she would fall down the stairs. Um, so I think we all as a little team and family became very, very concerned and dedicated to documenting this journey. And most importantly, her family, you know, became very comfortable with us as we built a relationship and being able to share their side of the story in this complicated story and what it's meant to them to have a guardianship for Wendy and how that's impacted their relationship with her. And it's a complex story. And, and by the end, when we found out after talking to her son and Alex at the end of the very end of filming that they had, when we interviewed them, that they had found out about this dementia diagnosis, we stopped filming with Wendy the then, though I think it was the next week. And um and really, um, as you can see in the film, um talk to Will who I do think had good and has, you know, cares about Wendy a lot. Um, yeah, I agree. Getting, getting her help, the help she needs. And the as he said in his words, you know, the guardian stepped up and got her in a facility. And so, um, yes, it was, it was a complex, sensitive journey that was a labor of love truly for all of us on the team. Yeah, complex is the understanding is an understatement. I do have a question just to sort of, mm -hmm. some of the questions that I personally would like answered. Okay, so at the beginning mm -hmm. of the show, Wendy says that Wells Fargo has locked up her money. She keeps name checking Wells Fargo, Wells Fargo, Wells Fargo. And that seems to be the beginning of the whole discussion about guardianship. So where did this guardianship start? Because what you find, or what I think later in the in the film her guardian sucks. You should not be able to trot off to LA and not have your guardian have an idea when this is seriously, clearly someone who is incapacitated either due to addiction or a mental disorder. So we start with Wells Fargo's frozen the money because they're seeing suspicious activity. How do we jump from that to guardian one easy step? I wish we could answer that, Melissa, and that we have that same question and had throughout. Un unfortunately, because the court proceedings are under seal, there's no way for us or anyone or even the family to access what the argument was, right? For one, why Wendy should be under guardianship, and two, why her family should not be a part of that guardianship. Because there was a period of time after, you know, um, you know, when Wendy was down with her family, that they, this Kevin Jr. did have power of attorney, you know, and, and was healthcare proxy. I believe Wanda was the healthcare proxy for a short time, you know, but that all came to an end when the court ordered Wendy back up to New York, you know, and out of the care of the family and placed her guardian, you know, in charge. Um, so literally that court proceeding was a very small court proceeding and none of the family members were allowed to be present at that court proceeding. Okay, so, so wait, hold on. This is where yeah. I'm confused. Yeah. And you're making it much clearer, but I need bite-sized pieces. <laughs> so you're telling me that because of the perception of financial malfeasance, ooh, look at my big words today, um, any bank can go to a court and say, hey, this person clearly isn't, doing a right thing and we want them to have a guardian who started 
Yes, that's that's correct. That's my understanding. Every every state has different laws, but it's it's astoundingly easy yeah. to file a petition for guardianship in most of these courts. And a lot and it doesn't have to be a bank, it could be pretty much anyone in some states that just has suspicions or has an agenda. Um and look God, I hope my son doesn't hear this. Yeah, but I mean, it makes you really think about getting your your papers in order, your legal, you know, things in order so that it's very clear if something, if you were to become mentally incapacitated, what is the chain of command, you know, of who Mm -hmm. you want in charge and making that very clear. Now, they could still come and say, you know, say, Melissa, your son is in charge of your, you know, your fortune. You know, um, he's not doing a good job and we don't trust him. So we think we should take control. And thank you so much, you know, uh, Melissa's family, but you're no longer needed. That's the gist of what occurred, you know, here with the Williams Finney family. Now, we don't know the Guardian's reasons for stepping in. We don't know that because they're not available to us. And no one, of course, we try to, you know, ask everybody, you know, to provide comment, but they won't. And guardianships are typically very, very, very difficult to pry into and understand. So she's at one point gave Kevin, her son, power of attorney. They start to suspect him of spending too much money. She keeps saying they cut off her money, but she still seems to be shopping. So obviously she was somehow accessing money, but who was, where was her business manager? She had so much money and properties and this, where was the business manager? Cause I can only assume she was not sitting and doing her own taxes. Good question. We don't know. You know, we just don't know like where those people were or why they, there were a lot of transitional movements, right. With her management when this guardianship started and a lot of the old guard moved away, you know, and the new guard came in. But at at that point, really the guardian, you know, was financially in charge of everything, you know, that, that that's their, their, their biggest role, you know, is to be in charge of all the finances. And then they have this, this other role, right. Of being overseeing her healthcare. Um, And we did go film, we did go with Wendy, I think it was on day or one or two of filming, we said we need to, is Wendy have doctor appointments, we need to be with her and see that she's getting care. And, uh, you know, there was a healthcare proxy, right, uh, present during the the filming of those scenes, or Erica, you did have conversations with her. So there was somebody there, but they were just sort of like driving her around to appointments, you know, Um, and none of that information was being transferred back to the family at all during that time. And I found that, and Erica, you sound like you were really boots on the ground in front row for this. Mm-hmm. There's clearly something wrong with this woman. Mm-hmm. And the, I'm assuming the guardian was aware of all this kind of erratic behavior. How can they just sort of sit there and... and and watch. I mean, and there all these doctors, they're just signing off and saying, oh, she's fine. I mean, I feel like there's no, no one's watching. I mean, that's what I found so fascinating. You guys are the only ones watching. And it's supposedly she's got the guardian and the financial guardian and doctors and a medical proxy. It was like crickets. Melissa, that's what it felt like. And that's why we like. honestly kept filming. Because we were more scared about what would happen if we went away than if we stayed. And we always knew that we could always film this footage. And if we all agreed down the road that it shouldn't air, it wouldn't air, you know. Um, and but it, it, it and I can speak to the compassion and care that Erica and Michael Armstrong and who was our supervising producer, who you hear throughout the documentary, you know, um, they became very, very close with Wendy. You can see how much she needed you know, that human contact that she was missing. And the, the, they happened to just be incredibly compassionate, wonderful, kind people. And honestly, that's part of the reason why they were put into the project. Um, but, it, it, you know, we cared so much about her that we didn't want to see anything happen to her. And, you know, in some ways, you know, we're like, let's just keep rolling and keep going until we get the family in place and can see that Wendy is in a safer place. Um, Remember also that this was over the course of a year. So you're seeing it condensed into four hours. 
So there were lots of ups and downs and highs and lows and conversations occur occurring, you know, accor across that year that were very complex. And there were many days when we like wanted to stop, you know, and uh, we just felt like it was important to go on once the truth started revealing itself that this is a woman who's alone in her apartment, suffering, lonely, in danger, honestly, and there she's under a legal guardianship. And no one on the guardian at the guardianship will take our call. You know, they yeah. won't. They won't respond to us. They won't answer our calls. They we were even just calling to say, can we speak off camera about the situation? You know, because there were times where we were alarmed, and we were, of course, we were speaking to Will, her manager, who was there every day, and was also in many ways a caretaker for Wendy. Mm -hmm. um, but we didn't know how much of that conversation was getting through, you know, to the to the guardian or not, because that was Will was the conduit through which all communications to the guardian went. Um, but yeah, I think, and I can't overstate how much our, we were concerned about her well being and wanted to be there to make sure she was okay for a large part of the filming, especially later on. I, it, yeah. One thing I never saw and the public never saw, and I even, I, I never saw even in the professional and slightly personal, not overtly personal situations. I, I was shocked and in asking people, I, I have found out that it's part of dementia, how rude she was and disrespectful mm. she was and angry she was. And I did not, how, how well versed were you in sort of the, the, a lot of the symptoms of dementia that people don't talk about before you got into this? Or did you have to start Googling and reading encyclopedias on the fly? The only reason I know about this is because one of my good friends, one of her oldest friends had early onset Alzheimer's. And they said, in hindsight, they looked back and it makes sense for with a lot of this sort of anger that didn't make sense at the time and behavior being rude and all these things at the time, then they, they knew. Did you have to suddenly like bone up on all this? Well, um, that's a great question. And I think once, you know, the family shared with us that they had been told that she had been diagnosed with dementia, we didn't know, I didn't know until last week about the frontal temporal or the aphasia. But then, you know, I, of course, we, I did do research and then looking back on our experience, it began to make more sense. But at the same time, you know, Wendy is known for being outspoken and unfiltered and, very direct, you know, um, the first thing she said to me, I can't believe I'm saying this. The first thing she said to me when I met her is she's like, how old are you, Erica? <laughs> and then she's like, you look your age. <laughs> so, I mean, she's just <laughs> like that. You know what I yeah. mean? And um, I was like, but that, you know, there's a humor about Wendy, you know, that she just is, has always been, you know, speaks her mind and she is unfiltered. So, I sort of thought that was Wendy, you know, and um, but later to your point, once I learned more um, about dementia and, you know, did research, it began to add up more why she might have been rude to the nail technician, you know, um, but I. Um, yeah, it when when that press release came out last week from her team, who we don't really know who that was, I don't know who did that press release. Um, uh, it did make me reflect a lot back, you know, on our journey and maybe put some things into context. Um, and, but she was, you know, at times struggling to express herself. And I think there's a moment when I say that to Will, you know, when he says, do you think she's able to do a podcast? And I just, you know, she did struggle to express herself at times. Um, but it was but very other unclear throughout, you know, like just to, you know, like, how much of this was alcohol abuse mm. and how much of it was something else. Right. You know, right. cause we're also, listen, we all know have friends who are in recovery and, you know, have been through this. And, and a lot of people are saying, Oh, well that alcohol can cause brain fog and that it can be a, you know, a, a, a result of, of this kind of drinking. So we, without having any information on our hands, there were so many different types of explanations right. that could make sense as we were, moving our way through this of course now with in retrospect 
we can look back and see, oh, that must have been the dementia. That must have been, you know, the aphasia, you know, and this type of dementia do- can cause erratic behavior. And right. we did witness erratic behavior. Um, um, so it was just very confusing to us all. And believe me, we were asking all these questions in front of and behind the camera, you know, um, all the way through. And, and ultimately, the family trusted us. It was a big thing for them, you know, to step forward and, and say those words, dementia, because no one wanted to be the first person, you know, to to say those words. And, um, you know, but ultimately, they just felt like it was the truth and it needed to be shared. And, and it also like helped people understand the stakes of their kind of battle to be back in their mother's, you know, sister's aunt's life. Um, like, you know, how many, you know, great days does Wendy have left, you know, um, with this kind of a, of a diagnosis and shouldn't she be spending them with her family? How long did the family know before they admitted it to you guys? How long or, or, anyone in her circle before they said, okay, look, we, we, we've known this for a minute. Um, what do you think, Mark? Um, I think it was probably a couple months, you know, um, I think the so nothing first thing, egregious. no, I, I think, listen, we, of course, Kevin became on as an EP and there were all kinds of conversations, right. And we had to do legal agreements with Kevin jr. And, you know, so we, we had many conversations with him going into it, you know, about the parameters and what the family wanted to talk about. And he was very, very open. You know, he was ready at that point because he had been quiet for a long time. Um, so I think they all sort of wrestled with it in their own timelines. Um, but I also think it was they got to know us and they got to know Erica and Michael and the filmmaking team. And they trusted them that 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 Wendy's best interest would be, you know, in, in, you know, in hand. Um, and, and there's, they've seen the documentary, obviously, and are, are totally supportive of, supportive of it. And that's why we also intentionally didn't, we made sure that there was no leak, you know, of that information yeah. prior to the documentary, we never would have made that part of the press, because we felt like it was important to share that information in the context of the story, you know, that you see, um but you know wendy's you know care team decided to to release that information prior you bring up kevin and you and this is because you guys did a good job your emotions about kevin vacillate throughout the series i found so first i was like and maybe because i know more behind the scenes first i'm thinking this poor kid had to go through a horrific, very public, very embarrassing divorce, right? Managed to salvage a very strong relationship with his mother. He then sees her go into chaos. She obviously trusts him to give him power of attorney. And then he's accused of doing all these things and they don't want to hear, the guardian doesn't want to hear, but my mother threw me a hundred thousand dollar birthday party. Yeah. Should he have stopped her? Yeah. Stopping Wendy from doing something. Good luck. And then you see how painful it is for him to be with her. And you see him actively trying to get her healthy. Why is the narrative so negative about him in the wider world when you guys portray him as a really a good kid. Do you think that's going to get through? Is that going to help the family's cause? In, well, interesting. The one thing I, to that point, um, I think my time that I spent with Kevin, that we spent with Kevin, my impression of him, here's this young man, he was in his teens, right? When he was clearly, I mean, this is, a story that millions of people can probably relate to. Here's a young man, a, a teenage boy dealing, how do I deal with my mother's struggle Addiction. with alcohol and the impact it had on him and their relationship. And he was so, my sense was he was so concerned, like trying constantly to fix it, knowing, maybe not knowing, knowing you can't really fix it, right? It's up to the person. Right. 
and um, trying to uh, do everything in his power. But in the end, we all are powerless over someone else's addiction, um, but trying to do everything he could to keep her healthy. And I think you feel that, at least I felt that when I spoke to him and spent time with him. And, you know, I don't think I had any idea how many times in his life at a young age he was trying to save his mother or take care of her, which isn't easy. And the, you know, he said he didn't misspend her money, that she gave approval and, you know, who, I don't know, but um, I feel like he at a, has been caught up in a very challenging situation. And now I think the film also raises a lot of questions about the mechanics of a guardianship. And one, I'm a mom. I don't understand why in a guardianship can a child not contact their parent for, it's now been since last April. I mean, she can contact him, but not the other way around. Um, there's just so many questions that come up um, from this story. Um, and I don't know, to your point, you know, why he's been portrayed in the media. I mean, I just, my impression of him from the time we spent with him was, um, you know, a, a young man who's very concerned about his mother and trying to keep her safe. And um, I don't even think we included everything about all the times that he stepped in to, to try to save her from some serious addiction issues. Yeah, she's trying to save her from herself. Hundred hmm. percent. And I said he was trying to save her from her house, from herself. Mm -hmm. And he grew up with Wendy like this. She's been open about her addiction issues for many, many years. So Kevin's a young man; like he grew up, you know, dealing with this his entire life. And Wendy was a was, and I hope is, a very wealthy woman. And it's not unheard of. Or, you know, somebody in her circles to spend $100,000 on her birthday party or let her son order whatever he wants from Uber Eats and charge it to the credit card. You know, if, if those are the reasons why he was removed, then that seems, you know, uh, uh, like ridiculous in some ways, you know, um, because at the level of wealth that Wendy had at her height, you know, that that really is up to her you know, how, how to spend her money. So I think it's important. That's why it's so difficult, Melissa, to get to the bottom of this because the court proceedings are cloaked in secrecy and you can't pull the documents and say, what, what, what did they say, you know, about the family? You know, what, what's the reason they gave? And can the family now have a hearing to discount what, you know, the other side is claiming? Or if something was true then, maybe it's not true now. Right. You know, and maybe now, you know, a couple of years later, this should be reviewed. And and the guardianship is supposed to be reviewed on an annual basis, you know, as a matter of fact, you know. Um, and so maybe that'll happen this year and the family will be able to go in and simply, you know, explain, you know, and, and take a role um, here. But I agree with Erica, like, even if you want to have someone else handling the finances, Wendy should be able to see her family and feel their touch and yes. be with them and share a meal and share memories. Um, I mean, look how heartbreaking and, and, you know, those scenes with her father were. Her father's Ugh. 93 years old. You know, his her father's not going to be around forever. Uh, why is Wendy being kept away from seeing her her father, her sister, her brother, you know, her brother, her son, her nephew, her niece, all who love her? You know, we were, we had seen all the press articles, right, before we met, you know, Kevin and the family. And I think something that was just like very um not so i don't want to say surprising but relieved we were relieved to see how wonderful this family was even despite with their ups and downs and they everybody doesn't get along like everybody's family but i don't think you can deny that their hearts are there in the right place you know i i was gonna get to that but oh go ahead oh. I was going to just mention one thing. Uh, when we were with Alex, when she came to New York and hadn't seen Wendy in, I think, almost a year, she was truly so excited to see Wendy. I mean, you could feel it just being around her. And when she got to the apartment and so many things were gone and Wendy, like the difference between Wendy a year ago to that time, I think was very um, disturbing for Alex. And 
it was very upsetting to her. And to Mark's point, when you think about it, um, time is precious, right? Like it really, um, and I think Alex realized she wasn't in the best of care and that things weren't okay. And that was really upsetting to her and shocking. It, it, when you when she is with her father, it is absolutely heartbreaking. And there's a scene where she is with almost all of her family and she doesn't know where she is or who's with her. You capture so beautifully the pain. It's heart-wrenching to see firsthand. Mm -hmm. And you see that the strongest people in the family are her sister, her niece, and her nephew. And it feels like that moment, like Alex, her niece, was already starting to do things. Her nephew had a very clear understanding of what was happening and what to, was going on. It felt like that dinner or that visit really is what propelled her sister to action, to say, it's enough. With a woman like that, I can't, it, it's really hard to get your head around that she has not been assigned her guardian. This is not a lightweight. She's a lawyer. I mean, Wanda's a lawyer. Yeah. And I think she had, as she said in the film, she had volunteered to do it and felt that she was capable. But again, I don't think she knows or any anyone in the family knows why they, you know, what this, why they were not uh, chosen to have that role. I do it feels feel... like the, it feels like the table should be turned in a way that like it should be much harder just from the outside mm -hmm. now having seen this it should be much harder for guardians to step in and remove care from the family it feels like the burden of proof should be reversed like you really have to prove that you're going to improve this person's care if you really want to step in and, and appoint a stranger you know, right. to manage this person really better be, you know, in in dire jeopardy to remove all family members, you know, from from the care. And we don't understand. And I think everyone has this question, right? Like, it's infuriating. Why isn't Wanda involved? Why isn't Alex involved? Why isn't Kevin involved? Like, why not? And if there's a reason for it, then I guess tell us why. They should tell us why and tell them why. Tell them why. Mm -hmm. Even if you don't want to make it public, tell them why so right. they can hire an attorney and either and dispute it if they want. Um, Will comes off. At first, I thought, oh, God, with Will, like a big old eye roll. I feel like he genuinely cares about her and cared about her and is genuinely distressed that he has no idea where she is or what she's doing. And he comes off as a lovely person. That publicist. I, I mean, Let's discuss for a minute the publicist. I, I, her name escapes me. Now, I am not necessarily proud to say I have had to work with crisis PR. The, the, the behavior is well beyond comprehension. First of all, mm -hmm. how did she, for someone who doesn't have a credit card, how the hell did she get on a plane and buy two tickets? Number two, why is she driving around LA? Why is she letting her drink? Why is she letting her, why would she set up a meeting? Why would she talk about putting her in uh, on the red carpet? Who is this woman? Where did she come from? And please tell me she's crawled back under whatever rock. Well, I do know that Wendy is no longer employing Sean, you know, to be her. I would hope so. I know. Um, and uh, we echo your questions. I think you can hear a lot of the questions directly to Sean. Like, and we really gave her every opportunity to kind of explain the whys and, um, I, I just don't, I can't speak to her motivations, but I, I do believe that neither Will nor Sean were aware of Wendy's diagnosis, like that they, they hadn't been made aware of it. 
Um, I don't know if that for a fact, but that I do believe that and that what was told up to us at the time, you know, that they, they're not aware of any, you know, larger medical issues. Um, listen, Sean says in the, the piece that she doesn't even think Wendy has a drinking problem, which was, you know, Wendy's already said publicly many times that she does. Um, so, I yes, think Will, it, it was all infuriating I think Will, to watch. Yeah, I think Will is a good guy. I really do. And I really genuinely believe he cares. If Sean is really operating out of a place in her heart, I've never seen a worse publicist in my life. <laughs> and I've worked with a lot of publicists. Well, you would know, Melissa. You would know. Uh, I'll take, uh, I'm not going to uh, take that as an affront, but yeah. Oh, no, yes. Well, no, we've all worked. Oh, worked I know. I know. But I'm just saying. Years. And, and yes, we. it was highly unusual to say the least. And, and honestly, that's why it was kept in the film, you know, because it, it was just such an unusual event and wendy wasn't allowed to be traveling out of state like it wasn't supposed no, to happen we had no idea that wendy was in la we literally were supposed to film with her the next day and it was actually alex this is not in the film but we were zooming with alex just talking to her and about her trip to new york and she said well my aunt's in la and we're like no she's not <laughs> we're filming with her tomorrow and then the next thing we know Wendy's in LA. I mean, she was in LA and Sean had taken her the night before and we had no idea. Will didn't know. I mean, it was just unbelievable. Um, and uh, we were st stunned. And I do think you see in the progression of the film, Will's transformation in a way, what's the better word? Um, you know, Will Growth. really, yeah, he really does change and he does care. And he, um, and we saw that. And um, I think he really, you know, he does care about Wendy. And he, um, I really deeply believe that. And he, he, he did, he did grow and he, he did care and he did push to get her in, into a treatment facility. I, I want to echo that too. I, I do believe that Will's heart was in the right place. Although I think his actions, you know, people can criticize them as much as they want, but he was also in the dark a lot of the time. And I think it was a lot of wishful thinking. Like he wanted to believe the best. He wanted to believe that Wendy could get back and have a podcast. And, um, you know, he's not the most experienced manager in the world and that's not a dig, you know, he just um, uh, didn't necessarily know how to pull all the levers, you know, to, to you know, make this work or have the right conversations about a podcast. But I mean, it, it also just became clear later on that you know she wasn't going to be able to do a podcast and and he copped to that and let go of that narrative and then kind of you know embrace the idea of getting her back with her family getting her back with her son making sure that like we could you know better wendy's combat her loneliness right like and get her back in touch with her community and her world i i believe his intentions were good I, re I really do believe he genuinely cared. Where is Kevin Sr. through all of this? We don't know. You know, he was never considered. Wendy made it clear from the beginning that she didn't want him involved um, in any capacity. Um, and we just never pursued, you know. Um, um, you know, I may have, listen, I had a conversation with Kevin Sr. way back when, when we did the What a Mess documentary. And, mm -hmm. you know, they were going through a messy divorce at the time. And, he didn't want to be involved in that. And uh, I think I did reach out and text him once, you know, later in the production to see if we could get on a call and talk and he never replied. Um, yeah. But he was never going to be figure into this narrative because he's just not a part of Wendy's life at all currently. And is he in still in touch with his son? Did they still have any kind of a relationship that you're aware we of? We didn't really discuss discussed that with kevin jr um yeah we don't i don't know i don't know i don't i don't think they're around each other that much i think you know they're in different geographical locations but kevin didn't really get into that with us so give us the update for people who haven't been following this where is wendy as of today and what's happening with her well, we, that is the one question that remains unanswered. You know, the title of the, the documentary is called Where is Wendy Williams? Um, we don't know exactly where she is, the, the, the location of it, but we do know that she's in a, 
a facility that is, you know, designed to treat, you know, the issues that she had, she's suffering from, you know, cognitive issues and dementia, uh, and that she's been there for quite some time. And that, um, though, although we haven't spoken to her, her family has spoken to her. Um, you see some of this in the documentary, but that those conversations have continued and they, they feel like, like when she does call them and they're able to, to get her on the phone, she sounds much better. She sounds more clear. She's of course not, she's sober because she's not, doesn't have access to any substances and they're hopeful, you know, they're, they're hopeful that she's sounding much, much better. So um, we only know kind of know that information secondhand from the family because we haven't been able to, to, to speak with her directly. Yeah. The, at the very end of the film, you have a recording of her talking to her sister and she sounds great. Yeah, even when she calls Will, right, when he's sitting down for an interview and you hear her voice. I mean, I have to, when I heard that, it really hit me. I thought, wow, she just sounds, the energy, the vitality, you know, there's a vitality and an energy. And she, I, it was made me feel very hopeful that she's doing better. And um, that, honestly, um, that meant means so much to all of us that she is, seems to be in a much better place, in a safe place, getting the care she needs. And that is what we were most concerned about every step of the way, particularly at the end when we really were pushing that, like what is what is gonna happen next for her? Erica Hansen, yeah, we're, we're, we're Oh, go ahead, go we're, ahead. We're, no, we're very hopeful that we that she's now in a better place. We've left her in a better place than we found her, you know, and that she is getting the, the adequate care you know, that she needs for her particular, you know, battery of issues. Um, because there had been a lot of treatment centers and things like that, that maybe weren't, you know, the best way to, to handle what she, what her diagnosis actually is. Um, but with care, she can get better, you know, and she can have great days and have, you know, a good life and be around friends and be around loved ones. And so I, we really just hope this, documentary can expedite you know that journey of the family back with their loved one um and you know that we had some small role you know in pushing for her to get the care she needed because you know yes we're filmmakers but we're also human beings and like i can't tell you how many conversations we were having you know towards the end of filming where we were absolutely insistent that something had to be done that she could not be left in that apartment any longer by herself one little thing that I just wanted to mention in her living room on her couch was a pillow that your mother gave to her. And anytime anybody came to visit, that's the first thing she would point out. And she'd curl up on the sofa with that pillow. So I just wanted to share that with you, that that was, um, that clearly meant a lot to her. And Melissa, we'll try to find the footage, you know, about it, uh, of it and, and send it to you because she just loved your mother so much. And yeah. it, it brought her to tears telling us the story of how much that pillow, you know, meant to Wendy, you know, because she loved your mother so much. Well, thank you yeah. so much, Erica Hansen, Mark Ford, now that you've made me choke up again. Not appreciative of that. Uh, where is Wendy Williams now on Lifetime? Well, thank you. It was really lovely to meet you. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa.